Hello everyone, welcome to Pure 2 Chapter 7 Differentiation. Another wonderful resource made by Dr Frost. Don't forget to hit subscribe. I think that's what I've got to say, yeah? <laughs> okay, so what we're looking at today is decreasing and increasing functions. So, what does it even mean for a function to be increasing or for a function to be decreasing, okay? For a function to be increasing, we can see that um, our gradient is going to be greater than zero. Okay, so we can see this, this is increasing. If it's strictly increasing, our gradient is greater than or equal to zero for all of x. This is a fun fact that you should probably write down. Strictly increasing is our gradient function is greater than or equal to zero for all of x. Uh, sorry, that's just increasing. Strictly increasing is just when our gradient is greater than zero for all of x, okay? So if we have a look here, and we have a look at this cubic, we can see that our gradient here, this is a positive gradient, so we can see when x is less than or equal to 2, we're increasing. So this is increasing for when x is less than or equal to 2. In between 2 and 4, what's happening with our gradient? Our gradient is decreasing. We have a negative gradient, and that's a decrease. So we're decreasing between 2 is less than or equal to x, is less than or equal to 4. And then, what's happening when x is greater than or equal to 4? We are increasing. Now what happens when our gradient at this point? What is our gradient at this point? The gradient at the point where x equals 2? Zero. zero. Absolutely, our gradient equals zero. And what's the gradient at the point when x equals 4? Zero. zero. Absolutely. So, here are two types of example questions that we might get about increasing or decreasing functions. It says show that the function is increasing for all real values of x. Now, if it's increasing, we want to show that the gradient function is greater than or equal to zero. If we're showing that this is increasing, if it was strictly increasing, it would be the gradient function is just greater than zero. But because it says increasing, it's greater than or equal to zero. So if we want to know the differential of this, because we know this is the notation for differentiate, Okay, and the gradient function is to differentiate x cubed plus 6x squared plus 21x plus 2. Okay, x cubed differentiated, bring the power down and decrease the power by 1. Bring the power down, 2 times 6 is 12, 2 take away, 1 is 1. Bring the power down, 1 times 21 is 21, x to the power of 0 is 1 and 2 differentiates to nothing. We have to show that this is greater than or equal to zero. Now this is where chapter one proof comes in handy because we're showing that this is positive for all real values of x which is a question that we used to have in one of the proofs. How do we do that? Okay so we need to complete the square so first of all I'm going to divide everything by three. Luckily everything is a factor of three so that makes life a lot easier because I can just divide it all by three and not have to worry about taking three out as a factor. Complete the square. x plus two squared minus four plus seven is greater than or equal to zero. x plus two squared plus three is greater than or equal to zero. Now we cannot just stop there. What we have to do is we have to write a specific, specific thing, okay? First of all, 
x plus 2 all squared is greater than or equal to 0 for all real um, values of x. of x, okay, and what else? Yeah, we've got, so we can just write, therefore, x plus 2 squared plus 3 is greater than or equal to 0 for all real x. Therefore, f of x is increasing. Okay, nice and simple. Okay, find the interval on which the function is decreasing. If it's decreasing, we know our gradient has to be less than or equal to zero. Okay, so step one, differentiate x cubed plus 3x squared minus 9x. So bring the power down, decrease the power by 1. Bring the power down, decrease the power by 1. Bring the power down, decrease the power by 1. We should be really happy with this. So this is our gradient function. Now we have to show that this is less than or equal to 0. Um, no, we don't have to show it, sorry. We need to find the interval for where this is true. So we need to find the values for uh, where 3x squared plus 6x minus 9 is less than or equal to 0. So we need to find the values for x. Now this is like one of those discriminant questions. Do you remember? If it's less than or equal to 0 and it's positive, we're essentially saying we want the values in between two numbers. So step 1, we're going to solve for x. So we can divide everything by 3. x squared plus 2x minus 3 is less than or equal to 0. I could factorise x plus 3, x minus 1 is less than or equal to 0. x equals negative 3, x equals positive 1. Because our function is less than or equal to 0, that means that our x is going to be less than or equal to 1, but greater than or equal to negative 3. So what we would say is f of x is decreasing in the interval minus 3, 1. Okay, test your understanding, off you go. Okay, so show that the function x cubed plus 16x minus 2 is increasing, so we need to show that our gradient function is greater than or equal to 0. Our gradient function is equal to 3x squared plus 16. And now what we need to do is show that it's greater or equal to 0. Now, so we know straight away that x squared is greater than or equal to 0 for, for all real values of x. Okay? Therefore, 3x squared plus 16 is greater than or equal to 0 for all real x. Um, therefore, f of x is increasing. Okay, for the second one, we want to find the interval at which it is decreasing. So I want to know when my gradient function is less than or equal to zero. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to differentiate 3x squared plus 12x minus 135. I'm assuming all of these are going to be a factor of 3. x squared plus 4x Minus 45. So we need to show, we need to find the interval for which this is decreasing. So less than or equal to zero. Plus nine minus five is less than or equal to zero. So x equals negative 9, x equals 5. So negative 9 is less than or equal to x, is less than or equal to 5. 
So we can say f of x is decreasing in the interval minus 9, 5. Right, very quickly, a recap. Can you all just differentiate this, please? And you can see here I'm doing d2y by dx squared. So, off we go. Okay, so step one, we have to rewrite this into a form where everything is in index form. Minus. Um, so, this is x, and this is x to the power of a half. So, I'm just going to have minus x to the power of a half over 3. Now once I've done that, I can differentiate. So bring the power down. 15. Take away 1 from the power. Bring the power down. Minus, and a third times a, uh, a half is a sixth. And decrease the power by 1. This is dy by dx. I then have to differentiate again to find d2y by dx squared. Bring the power down. 30x decrease the power by 1. A half times a sixth, negative times negative, plus 1 over 12x to the power of minus 3 over 2. So what we're going to be looking at is stationary points. And as was mentioned earlier, when the gradient equals 0, we have a stationary point. Now this stationary point could either be a minimum or a maximum. And what we're going to be looking at in this topic is how to find out if they're a minimum or a maximum, or a point of inflection, okay? We are going to get to that. Before we get to it, though, what we are going to have a look is we're going to have the find the coordinates of the turning points. To find these coordinates, it is as simple as you think. We need to find the gradient function, and we know the gradient at these points is zero, so we find the gradient function. We put this equal to zero, and we solve it for x. Once we find out what x is, we can substitute it back into the original equation to find the coordinates for y. I'll show you how simple it is. So, y equals x cubed plus 6x squared minus 135x. Our gradient function, dy by dx, equals 3x plus... Sorry, 3x squared plus 12x minus... 135. Now, we actually just solved this, didn't we? Okay, in a previous question. So I already know from the top of my head that x is going to equal negative 9 and x is going to equal 5. So x equals negative 9 and x equals 5. Now, once we know that, we need to find out what y equals. So when x equals negative 9, y equals... We put this into the original equation... When I substitute, I always use brackets. Minus 9 cubed plus 6 lots of minus 9 squared minus 135 lots of minus 9. I'm literally just going to throw that in my calculator and figure out what it is. I'm going to do the same for when x equals 5. I'm going to have y equals 5 cubed plus 6 lots of 5 squared minus 135 lots of 5. And I'm going to get another value. Now, it's really important. It says find the coordinates. So we will have to write these coordinates. Now, when I work out y, I'm going to get 972. This one, and then when I substitute in 5, I'm going to get negative 400. Now, read the question again. It says find the coordinates. So when x is minus 9, we're going to have 972 for our y. And when x equals 5, we're going to have negative 400. Okay? Now it's clear for us to see which point is which on this diagram. We can see that the point towards the left hand side is going to be minus 9 and 972, and the point to the right hand side is going to be 5 and minus 400. Okay? But sometimes we're not given the graph. So we are going to come into later how we're going to find the nature of the stationary point. 
So, it says find the least value. If it's looking for the least value, this is looking for the minimum point. Now, when we had a quadratic, if we were trying to find the minimum in GCSEs, we would different, um, sorry, not differentiate, we'd complete the square. So we'd have x minus 2 squared minus 4 plus 9, x minus 2 squared plus 5, so our minimum point would be 2, 5. This is what we used to do at GCSE. And this only works for quadratics, completing the square to find the minimum point. But what we're dealing with, we're not dealing with as much quadratics anymore. So if you do have a quadratic, you can still use that method. But you, can, you also know, if we're finding the minimum point, we're looking at when the gradient equals 0. So when we differentiate this, we're going to get 2x minus 4. We want to know when does that equal 0. That's when 2x equals 4, x equals 2. Now we have our x equals 2. We can substitute this back in. 2 squared minus 4 lots of 2 plus 9. This is going to give us 5. We now have our coordinates 2, 5. Exactly the same answer, but two different ways. So this works for quadratics, but as you can see, when we look at the next question, y equals root x minus x, there are no quadratics here. So we do have to do differentiation. If we're looking for a turning point, a turning point is where our gradient is 0. So always remember that. Turning points, gradient is 0. And you can write that down. Gradient equals 0. Turning point, gradient 0. OK? So if our y equals root x minus x, our gradient equals, I'm going to stop there, Step one, write it in indice form. y equals x to the power of half minus x. Step two, differentiate. OK, bring the power down. Decrease the power by one. Bring the power down. Minus one. OK, we want to know where does a half x to the negative a half minus one equals zero. Simple case of rearranging now. A half x to the negative a half equals one. Multiply everything by 2. x to the negative a half equals 2. What does it mean, this negative a half? How does that look? This is actually 1 over root x equals 2. Again, if you're not comfortable, we can rearrange. 1 equals 2 root x. A half equals the square root of x. So, how do I get rid of square root? Squared. So, a half squared is x. x equals a quarter. Now, I have probably done way more steps than I would ever normally do. I would go from this step straight to this step. Okay? But I just want to make sure you can all see exactly what's going on. So, now we have our x equals a quarter, how do I find my y? Substitute that in, and whenever I substitute, I'm always going to use brackets. Square root of a quarter minus a quarter equals a quarter. Okay, so the turning point is a quarter, a quarter. So, I know what you're all thinking. You're all thinking, why don't I have a plus or minus here? Okay, to have the answer. It's because we can't, we're not, we cannot use x as a negative value. Because we're doing the square root of x, and x cannot be negative. The graph only starts when x equals 0. It goes like this. So, we only have one root. So, be careful for that. Really think about what's going on. So, a point of inflection. So, this is where, for example, we, we're still... People, when they think about increasing and decreasing, okay, minimum, maximum. As you can see, if this is a maximum point, our gradient here is increasing, but our gradient here is decreasing. A point of inflection is where it changes 
from convex to concave, but we can still see our gradient is still increasing. Okay? So, not all points of inflection are stationary points, but a point of inflection which is a stationary point is known as a saddle point, and we're going to get more into that in a second. So, how do we know what's going on and if a point is a minimum, maximum or point of inflection? This is how we know. If we have a look at this point here, this is a minimum. Before the gradient, this is a negative gradient. Oh, sorry, before the point. It's a negative gradient, just before. At the point, it's zero, isn't it? So it's neutral. And after, the gradient is positive. And as you can see, it's making that lovely smiley face. So we have negative, zero, positive. A point of inflection. Before the gradient, we are positive gradient. Um, the gradient at the point is neutral, so it's zero. And the gradient after the point is still positive. You can see here, positive, zero, positive. And then we have our maximum point. The gradient just before the point is positive. The gradient at the point, zero. And the gradient just after, negative. And you can see here, this is where we get our smiley face, our unhappy face. And this is like a, a smirk. Okay? That's what you have to think. So, we have two different types of methods of telling whether a point is a maximum, minimum, or a point of inflection. Okay? Now, remember, not all points of inflection have a gradient of zero. And if it does, then it's called a saddle. Okay? That was what we learned last time. So, step one we need to find the gradient function. So to find the gradient function, we're going to differentiate x to the power of 4 minus 32x. So the differential equals 3x, sorry, 4x cubed minus 32. Okay? Now, when it's a stationary point, the first thing we should think of, gradient equals 0. Okay? That is rule number one. So stationary points, the gradient equals zero. So that means that 4x cubed minus 32 equals zero. So 4x cubed equals 32. x cubed equals 8. x equals 2. Now we know what x is. I can substitute this back into here for y to find my coordinate of y. So y equals 2 to the power of 4 minus 32 lots of 2. And you can see when I substitute, I'm using brackets. I'm going to get minus 48. So my coordinate of this stationary point is 2 minus 48. Now, uh, I always say when in doubt, draw it out. But <laughs> pretty sure none of us here know how to draw x to the power of 4 minus 32x off the top of our heads without using a graphical calculator or Desmos. So, we're not going to be able to draw this to find out whether it's a maximum, a minimum, or a saddle point. So, you know, we go back to the when in doubt, work it out, because there will always be some form of equation to help us. So, what we're going to do is this, okay? Our strategy is we're going to find out is smiley face, a sad face, or one of those crooked emoji things, like a smeh type thing, okay? So, yesterday we looked at, um, we had these boxes, didn't we? And when x is equal to zero, our gradient, sorry, when x equals two, our gradient is zero, yeah? So when we're zero, we're neutral, like this. So, can somebody give me a number before two? 
One, absolutely. Just go one down, one below it. It's nice and easy. One. I'm going to substitute one into my dy by dx. So if I put one into here, I get four lots of one minus 32, which is four minus 32, which is minus 28. This is negative. How does a negative gradient look? Yes. Like that. Okay. That's how a negative gradient looks, isn't it? Then, give me a number above two. Three, yeah, because I'm looking at either side of this point. If I substitute three in, three cubed is 27. 27 multiplied by four is a large number. Minus 32 is also a positive number. We'll work it out just for um, the sake of it. But normally, you just know so 76, which is positive. A po 76 is a positive number, so we have a positive gradient. Okay, what emoji have I drawn? A happy face. Which leads me to believe that this point is in fact a minimum. Absolutely, therefore minimum. Nice and simple. Okay, by looking at this shape, we can see that this is a minimum, because this is how... This point is going to be either side of it looks like this. So nice and easy. This is one strategy. There is another way you can find out. But for now, we're just going to look at this way. So the second method, because some of us don't really like using the pictures or substitution, you know, we can actually differentiate again. So we can differentiate the gradient function. Okay? And it's quite nice because we're going to be drawing gradient functions soon. So, um, what I was saying just a second ago about, you know, when we put like the one on one side and the two on the other, we went above, yeah? You can see like the problems it faces, if two stationary points are really close together, it might skew with it, yeah? So you've got to be a bit careful. But this way will always give you the correct answer. And this is by using the second derivative, okay? So, at a maximum point, as x increases, the gradient is decreasing from a positive value to a negative value. So, to find a maximum point, if the second differential is less than zero, you have found a maximum. Okay. So, here are your three rules. When we do the second differential, if it's greater than zero, it's a minimum. If it's less than zero, it's a maximum. If it's zero, we're not sure, so go back to method one where we substitute values in. Okay? So it's not quite foolproof. So we're ready for this example. The stationary point of y equals x4 minus 32x is 2 minus 48. Use the second derivative to classify the stationary point. So this is the same example from earlier. So y equals x to the power of 4 minus 32x dy by dx equals 4x cubed minus 32. And then d2y by dx squared, our second differential, is 12x squared. Okay? So, what we need to do is substitute in our value of x, which is 2, so 12 watts of 2 squared. We know this is positive. This is greater than 0. Therefore, minimum point. Okay, and you can even put in there f dash dash of x is greater than zero. Okay? Okay, test your understanding. This is a previous exam question. As you can see, this is worth nine marks. You've got nine minutes. No, you don't. I'm going to give you five. Off you go. So the curve of the equation y equals x squared minus 32 root x plus 20 has a stationary point p. Use calculators. Calculator, sorry, calculus to find the coordinate of P. So step one, we need to differentiate, okay? So, step one, write in index form 32x to the power of a half plus 20. Step two, differentiate to find a stationary point. Stationary point, the first thing we should be thinking, the gradient function equals zero. So we're going to get 2x minus 16x, sorry, minus 16x to the power of negative a half 
Okay, so 2x minus 16x to the negative half equals 0. So, I'm going to have 2x equals 16x to the negative half. If I divide both sides by 2, I'm going to get x equals 8x to the negative half. And then I'm going to divide both sides by x negative half. Okay? So I'm going to get x over x to the negative half equals 8. x divided by x to the negative half using indice laws, this is 1 minus minus half. This becomes x to the power of 3 over 2 equals 8. Now, what does the power of 3 over 2 mean? Okay. If we square both sides, we'll get rid of the half, won't we? So, square, square. I'm going to get x to the power of 3 equals 64. How do I get rid of the cubed? Cube root both sides. So x equals 4. Okay? Nice and simple. Now we need to find y because it says find the coordinates. So to find y, I'm going to have y equals 4 squared minus 32 lots of root 4 plus 20. So y equals 4 squared is 16 minus 64 plus 20. 16 minus 64 plus 20. Minus 28. And it's really important. It says coordinates, so we have to write the coordinates. 4 and negative 28. It now says determine the nature of the stationary point. So remember, we can use two ways. I would prefer you to use this method where you differentiate twice. So d2y by dx squared equals 2x differentiated is 2. Minus 16x to the minus a half differentiated is plus 8x to the negative 3 over 2. I'm now going to substitute in x equals 2 to find the nature of the stationary point. Remember, because if our differential is greater than 0, it is a... Sorry, everyone, I meant four. Two was in the last question. This is a minimum. If we substitute in our value and it's less than zero, it's a maximum. And if we get equal to zero, go back to the drawing method. So now, when we substitute in our x coordinate of the stationary point, it's four. So two plus eight lots of four to the negative three over two. What does that equal? 2 plus 8 bracket 4 bracket to the power negative 3 over 2 is 3. Okay, 3 is greater than 0, therefore minimum point. Right, so sketching graphs. Um, what you're going to do is first find the stationary points. Okay, what does that mean? There's going to be more than one. And then we're going to use that to help us sketch the graph. So off you go. Okay, everybody. So let's see. Um, step one, we need to find the stationary point. So write everything in indice form. Oops. Y equals x to the minus 1 plus 27x cubed. If we differentiate... Remember, stationary points means our gradient function equals zero. Bring the power down, decrease the power by one. Bring the power down, 81. Decrease the power by one. Okay, we need to solve this equals zero. So minus x to the minus two plus 81x squared equals zero. So what does that mean? Um, 81x squared equals x the power of minus 2. Now, 81x squared equals 1 over x squared. So how do I get the answer? Multiply both sides by x squared. So 81x4 equals 1. Divide both sides by 81. So x to the power of 4 equals 1 over 81. 
Now, because it's to the power of an even, we could have a positive or negative answer, and this is where some people get confused. If I fall through 1 over 81, my calculator is going to say a third. But you need to be clever. We could also have negative a third, and that is because why? If we have a positive power, we know negative times a negative times a negative times a negative is also a positive. Okay, so there's always two solutions. I'm now going to substitute this into my original equation to find, so y equals bracket bracket to the minus 1 plus 27 bracket bracket cubed. I'm going to substitute in a third and then substitute in negative a third. When I substitute in a third, I get 4. When I substitute in negative a third, I get negative 4. Now remember, stationary points. So, a third and 4, a negative a third, negative 4. These are my stationary points. So, now I have to sketch the graph. Now remember, whenever we sketch graphs, we're going to have x and y. Now, common sense. We know that x does not equal 0 because we're going to have a 1 over x, and that is not defined, OK? So, we, we know we're not going to have that, OK? How do we know, though, if we have a maximum or a minimum? Yeah, we could uh, double differentiate and substitute in. Your graph, though, should look like this. Okay, and our coordinates are a third and four, negative four, negative a third. Okay, sketching the gradient functions. There's a few things you need to have. Common sense, okay, and an understanding of gradients. Common sense. Let's start with that. What type of graph is this? Yeah, quadratic graph, isn't it? So we know we're going to have an ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, this is my y. If I was sketching my gradient function, if I find my gradient of this, I'm going to have 2ax, if I differentiate it, plus b. This is what my gradient function equation is. Can anyone tell me what type of graph this is going to give me then? A straight line. OK, so there's your common sense. You know that you're going to have a straight line. OK? Where's your other common sense coming from? Coming from here. This is our minimum point. Can somebody tell me what is the gradient at our minimum point? Zero, so that means our gradient is going to be zero here. So we know it's going to cross the x-axis at this point. Okay, now we're going to look at the left-hand side. This is... So we can see here, this is a negative gradient. Okay, negative. This is going to be negative. So my y values are going to be negative, and it is slowly increasing. So that means... This part of the line is going to be here because it's negative, slowly increasing. Okay, because we can see here our gradient slowly increasing to our minimum. And then here we have a positive gradient. And this is also increasing. So our line is going to continue here. So our gradient, our graph of a gradient function is a straight line. It's going to cross like this. Here is a, a lovely one by Dr. Frost, okay? Here is a harder one. <laughs> okay, before I sketch the gradient function, I want you to give it a go. So please just stop what you're doing and let's see, as you can see here, it's been split into one, two, three, four, five, six, seven parts. Let's see how many you can get right out of the seven. Off you go. So whenever I look at these graphs, now I haven't actually seen one of these in a past paper yet, okay? So I haven't seen how they're going to approach this as an exam-style question, but it's in the syllabus. So first of all, what I like to do is any changes in gradients from a positive to a negative would mean that the gradient is zero at some point. Because if you're changing from this to this, 
you've got to get over like a hill, haven't you? Yeah? So I have a look at where the gradient is zero. Okay? So here we go. First of all, where are gradient zeros? Maximum, minimums, or points of inflection? If we're looking for a maximum, we're looking for one of these shapes. A minimum, one of these, or a point of inflection, it's like a up, down, it's up, slow up. Okay, here we go. What is this? A minimum. So we know that the curve is going to cross the point here. Because my gradient zero there, isn't it? It's going to cross at zero, my y, yeah? Where else is the gradient zero? Here, I have a point of inflection. So that means my gradient is zero. Okay, the other place is, here, is a maximum. Okay, so that is here. So you can see I should have three points where my gradient equals zero. Okay, now this is the easy part. Are we ready? If my gradient is negative, it's going to be down here somewhere. If my gradient is positive, it's going to be up here, okay? Yeah? Okay, so let's look at this section. Is this a negative gradient? Yeah, yeah and it's slowly increasing to zero. So, it's very negative and it slowly increases to zero when we know it crosses here. Check, this is the first step, correct. Then, we're at zero because my gradient here is a minimum and my gradient on, on a minimum is equal to zero. What's this gradient here? This is positive, but let's think about it. From here to here, my gradient is increasing in number. Would you agree? If I was to draw a straight line here and work out the triangle, I don't know, I reckon I'm going to have a gradient of four. And then if I draw a straight line here, what's my gradient? Probably a half. So it increases and it comes back to zero. Okay, you ready for this? Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, think about the gradient. The gradient here is probably, it goes like one, two, three, four, 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 three, two, one, zero. There we go. Up, down. Can you see? Think about the numbers of the gradient. I know it sounds weird, but it really isn't. It's when we draw double gradients, that gets weirder. The gradient of the gradient. Don't worry, okay? <laughs> we'll focus on this. Right. Now we're here. From here to here, what is happening? It's a positive gradient still, yeah? Now we notice here it's slow, it stabilizes for a while and then it goes back to zero. Because remember, this is a gradient of zero. Anytime we're coming back to here, it's a gradient of zero. So, it's going to look a bit more like this. Stabilizes a bit longer, back to zero. Okay, <laughs> yes, questions? Basically, it's more like, okay, maybe then, it looks like it's a straight line, but it's just a, a smaller curve. And then what happens here? What type of gradient is this now? Negative. Negative, and you can see it's slowly coming back to zero, isn't it? So it needs to be below the line, because it's negative, and back up to zero, but we don't know if it hits zero, okay? So here we have it. The main points you have to realise, this is negative, so this needs to be below the axes. This is negative, so it's got to be below the axes. Every time you get a maximum, a minimum, or a point of inflection, I think I did that wrong. Minimum, inflection, maximum, my gradient is zero, so it needs to touch the x-axis. That is when y is zero. And if it's a positive gradient, it needs to come here. And if it stabilises, just, just hope for the best, okay? <laughs> So as you can see, Dr. Frost has done one with explanations for those of you who do not trust my drawings. Pause the screen here and just have a look. You ready to test your understanding? Off you go. Okay, here we go everyone. The first thing is, let's split this up. From here to here, the gradient is negative, right? From here to here, it's zero, so we know it's going to cross. 
and then from here to here is positive, but you can see it stabilizes. What do you mean? <laughs> like it stabilizes at a point here, okay? Like it tends, the, it looks like the gradient's nearly zero, so I'll show you what I mean by stabilizes. So, if it's negative at a constant rate, here we go, did it. Then the gradient goes up, and then it stabilizes. <laughs> so here we go. As we can see, the gradient is negative, but it's increasing. Then the gradient is zero. Then the gradient is positive. It increases slightly. And then what I mean by stabilizing is it decreases. It gets closer to zero, but not to zero. Yeah, it gets closer to zero, but not zero. <laughs> okay? Yeah? It's positive, but tending towards zero. Does that make sense here? This is tending towards the asymptote, which would make it zero. Okay. So for the last part of this chapter, we're going to look at optimization problems and modeling. Okay. For example, so, if you have a sheet of A4 paper and you want to fold this into a cuboid, what height should we choose for the cuboid in order to maximise the volume? This is a typical problem, everyday problem that people have. And how could we resolve that? Differentiation. Okay? And we use this for when we're trying to maximise or minimise a quantity. Because if we're trying to maximise or minimise something, we can find the differentiation, differentiate it, and we know if we're finding a maximum or minimum, this is essentially finding a stationary point. So it's when the gradient equals zero, okay? So, for example, another, um, if you have 50 meters of fencing and you want to make uh, an area for a bear in this shape, what, what is, um, how could we find the maximum area? So if you think about this, if I said to you, Okay, you've got 20 metres of fencing. What's your maximum area? Well, if you think, if you've got 20 metres of fencing, what could you do? You could have 1, 1, 9, 9. You've used 20 metres of fencing, but guess what? Your area's only 9. Okay? You could have 5, 5, 5, 5. You've used 20 metres of fencing, but your area is now 25. So instead of us sitting there and drawing it all out, there must be an easier way. Of course there is, using mathematics. So that's what we're going to look at. Okay, a large tank in the shape of a cuboid is to be made from 54 metres squared of sheet metal. The tank has a horizontal base and no top. So if it's already told us 54 metres squared, this is telling us the area, so we need to look at surface area, don't we? Okay? Now, if it's got no top, if you think we've got one side here and one side here, which we know is x squared times 2, so that's 2x squared. If we have the base, that is x times y. And then the two sides, well, this is also xy and xy, so we're going to have plus 3xy. This is going to give me 54. Now, we can see the volume, it says 18x minus 203x cubed. You can see straight away, we're just dealing with x's here. So I need to rearrange this to find out what y equals, because how do we find volume? y times x times x. So I can write that down. Volume equals x squared times y. But we need to rearrange the left-hand side to figure out what y is. So, 3xy equals 54 minus 2x squared. Okay? If I divide everything by 3x, you can get y equals 54 over 3x minus... 2x over 3. Okay, 54 over 3x is equal to 
18. So this is actually 18 over x. I'm going to substitute that into here. Volume equals x squared, lots of 18 over x minus 2x over 3. Uh, which is going to give me volume equals 18x minus 2 over 3x cubed. Okay, we've now proved it. It says, given that x can vary, use differentiation to find the maximum or minimum value of v. It hasn't told us what is our maximum or minimum value. So, what are we going to do? We're going to differentiate. So if our volume is 18x minus 2 over 3x cubed, dv with respect to x is going to be 18, bring the power down, minus 2x and decrease the power by 1. So 18 minus 2x squared. Now if we're trying to maximise or minimise, we're trying to find a stationary point, which means our gradient equals 0. So 18 minus 2x squared equals 0. So we're going to have 2x squared equals 18, x squared equals 9, x equals plus or minus 3. Now, why would I reject the negative 3? Because we cannot have a negative length. So this is thinking back to the context of the question. So we reject the negative 3, therefore x equals positive 3. Now what we want to do, it says given that x can vary, use differentiation to find the maximum or minimum value of v. It hasn't told us what's the maximum or minimum. We've, we've just found x equals 3. We're now going to substitute that into v. v equals... So v equals 18 lots of 3 minus 2 over 3 lots of 3 cubed which is, yep, yeah, so v equals 18 lots of 3 minus 2 over 3 lots of 3 cubed, which is 36. Okay, so that is our maximum or minimum volume, volume and it's 36 metres cubed. Okay, so this is a typical exam question. As you can see, 9... 11 marks okay off you go give it a try so a cuboid has a rectangular cross section where the length of the rectangle is equal to twice its width as shown in figure 2 and as you can see they've already labelled it the volume of the cuboid is 81 cubic centimetres show that the total length of the 12 edges of the cuboid is given by now this is a cuboid but they also haven't told us I've told us the length of the rectangle is equal to twice its width. But they also haven't told us the height, have they? No? So what do we know? If we were to call this our height, yeah? It says the volume of the cubic... Uh, the volume is 81. So I know 2x times x times h is 81. So... Two x times x times h equals eighty one. So I know that two x squared times our height is eighty one. So what is our height? Equals eighty one over two x squared. Yeah? Okay. The next, so we know what our height is, and it says show that the length of the 12 edges, okay, if we've got 12 edges, we're going to have four lots of this one, because I've got one, two, three, four. So what we're actually going to have is four lots of 2x, plus four lots of x, plus four lots of h, okay? Now, in our case, 4 lots of 2x is 8x, plus 4x is 12x, and then plus 4 lots of 81 over 2x squared, I'm assuming that's 162 over x squared. Okay, so there's three marks for just being able to do that. 
Okay, part B. Now, lucky for you, if you couldn't get part A, normally on these questions, part A would be like, try this. And part B would be like, hence, or use calculus to find the minimum of L. So if we've got to use calculus, that means that we have to differentiate. So L equals 12x plus 162x to the power of minus 2. Remember, whenever we differentiate, we need to write it in index form first. So if we differentiate L with respect to x, we're going to have 12. Bring the power down. Minus 324, I want to say. X to the power of negative 1. Yeah, sorry, negative 3, because we're decreasing the power by 1. Okay, I was just really concerned when that did 162 times 2 in my head correctly. Right, so now we've differentiated it, and it says to find the minimum value. If we're finding a minimum or a maximum, um, so because it says it's a minimum or a maximum, we have to put this equal to 0. So 12 minus 324x to the power of negative 3 equals 0. So I'm going to have... I'm going to do this slowly. Minus 324 over x cubed equals negative 12. So that means 324 equals 12x cubed. So x cubed equals 324 divided by 12, which is 27. So that means x equals 3. So that's it. Use calculus to find the minimum value of L. Is this our minimum value of L yet? No, because we've just found X. So I'm going to have to substitute this back into L. L equals 12 lots of 3 plus 162 lots of 3 to the power of minus 2. Which equals 54 centimetres. Part C, justify by further differentiation that the value of L that you have found is a minimum. Okay, so from last time, when we differentiate again, okay, we need to do D2. So we know that DL by DX is 12 minus 324X cubed. So differentiate again, D2Y by DX squared to get um, 3... 3, 2, 4 times 3, I can't do this in my head, is 9, 7, 2, x to the power of negative 4. Okay? We need to, when we put in x equals 3, if this is greater than 0, if d2y by dx squared is greater than 0, we have a minimum. If it's less than 0, maximum and if it equals zero if it, yeah if it equals zero go back to the diagram yeah okay so when i substitute x equals three and i'm going to get 972 multiplied by three to the power of negative four divided by three have negative four that's not right 9, 7, 2 times 3 to the power of negative 4. Uh, I get 12. Greater than 0, therefore a minimum. Oh, and that's good because the answer is a minimum. Because 12 is obviously greater than 0.